In this course on biblical ethics, the current lecture is the indicative and imperative in Paul. Here's the problem. We might look at 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8 to capture this. When we talk about the problem of indicative and imperative, we're using grammar to illustrate the issue. But it's really the issue of what is the relationship between theology and ethics, or between what is indicated by God's action for us, the indicative, that's on the theology side, and the imperative, what ought we to do? So in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, Paul says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. That's an indicative. It's a statement of fact, and it's theology. And it's followed then immediately in the same sentence with an imperative. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Now, the problem here is the problem between grace and works. If God has done certain things for the sinner, then why must the sinner do something else? Phrased in terms of the 16th century, the problem was, if we do something else, is this not works righteousness? If we do something else, are we relying on something other than God's grace? Why must we, in light of 1 Corinthians 5, why must we have uh, do certain things to keep the feast if indeed Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us? Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 7 and 11 through 13 to illustrate the issue of the so-called problem of the indicative and imperative. Paul says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin for whoever has died is freed from sin. On the indicative side, this sounds like there will be no occasion, no impetus, no interest in further sin on the part of the believer. And then in verses 11 to 13, we read, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. How is it you can have that indicative in verses 6 through 7 and this imperative to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus in verse 11. Verse 12, Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members, he continues in verse 13, to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Now, if we're to view this as a problem, the theological problem of how do we put this together, it, it would be like graduating from a university, getting your certificate in the mail, framing it and putting it on the wall behind your desk, and then getting a letter from the university that says you must do these certain things now uh, in relationship to the degree you just obtained. So that's the problem of the indicative and imperative. Now there are some very pastoral dimensions to this, this problem of the indicative and imperative. And while we can look at this in academic and scholarly ways, we need to realize that this is something that Christians do deal with in the church and pastors have to deal with as well. So for example, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 uh, through uh, the whole chapter, but uh, I'll pick up a few verses, verses 1, 2, and 5 uh, to illustrate the pastoral dimension of this for Paul. Paul speaking into a pastoral situation. 
He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. Now that problem is a problem that was dealt with in a famous work by Sophocles called Oedipus Rex, where Oedipus, unbeknown to himself, actually ends up marrying his mother. And the goddess visits all sorts of horror on the city as punishment for this. What that illustrates is even among the pagans, a man having his father's wife was considered horrific. I'm not suggesting Paul necessarily refers to that play, but that play would have been around for several centuries. Uh, and actually Oedipus is traveling from Thebes to Corinth in the actual story, uh, the actual play. And so it's not impossible that Paul would have known this and even had this in mind in writing that. He says though in verse two, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Why is it the church would be arrogant about something that even the pagans consider as wrong, as horrific, as sinful? It may be, as some have suggested, that they have understood Paul's theology of grace to be a theology of license. And therefore they're proud in how open they are as a welcoming church to this sinful practice. That's one possibility. It's possible to frame that around the language of freedom, which appears fairly often in 1 Corinthians as well. And that relates to that misunderstanding of a theology of grace, where the Corinthian church believes that they have been called into a life of freedom that would then give license to things such as this. Well, let's read on. In verse five, Paul says, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Now in this advice, he's simply giving the advice of Leviticus chapter 20 that talks about uh, the punishment to be visited on a person who does such a thing. In fact, the language of having your father's wife is language from Leviticus, both chapter 18 and chapter 20. And uh, it, therefore, it's not an issue of whether it was his actual mother or not, but it's, it's the language of the text in Leviticus that Paul's using. And so also, Paul is suggesting that what Leviticus says is to be done with such a person is something that the church should practice. In other words, Paul's applying the law to this pastoral situation in Corinth. Now he says, uh, deliver this man to Satan. That's not what Leviticus says, but Leviticus says to cut the person off from the community for the destruction of the flesh. Leviticus has in mind stoning a person to death, but uh, who's committed adultery and this sort of uh, sin. But in Paul's language, the word flesh refers to the uh, sinfulness of a person. And so he seems to have in mind here that by cutting the person off from the Christian community, this will lead to the person realizing separation from the kingdom of God, both now and ultimately and therefore will lead to the person dealing with the flesh and the church dealing with the flesh as well as sin with the hope that salvation might obtain. In other words, the person would repent and be forgiven and be restored both to the community and to the kingdom of God. That's how Gordon Fee reads the text and that's how I would read the text as well. Now compare the advice in 1 Corinthians 5 to Galatians 6. In, Galatians, in 1 Corinthians 5, the advice is to ostracize a sinful person from the church. 
In Galatians 6, Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Here in Galatians, we see that Paul recognizes that whatever the indicative of God's grace is, Christians may still sin. And in fact, he's dealing with the uh, understanding that there are going to be people in the church who will sin. And even those who are spiritual and can help restore that person by bearing their burdens with them and so fulfill the law of love, that is the law of Christ, they too could be pulled into uh, sinfulness. Nobody has reached a state of such perfection through God's grace that they might say that they're done with sin. So the possibility of sin remains. Now, as we consider the 1 Corinthians 5 passage and the Galatians 6 passage together, we see that there is a potential misunderstanding if we don't reconcile these texts by the same author. What Paul is saying is that uh, we need to deal with sin in the church. Both passages are saying that. The difference is that uh, Galatians 6 envisages the church dealing with this positively and, and uh, the person wanting to uh, move on from their transgression and, and the church involved in that. Whereas in 1 Corinthians 5, the individual is, uh, has decided that he wants to continue in that sin and the church has decided that it doesn't want to do anything about that. And that explains the differences between 1 Corinthians 5 and Galatians 6. In 1 Corinthians 5, we have the welcoming church. In Galatians 6, we have the church that is going to engage in uh, a, a process of um, leading a person to repentance, uh, dealing with their sin, and being restored. As we contemplate this issue of the indicative and imperative, it's probably helpful to take a moment to note the problem as it's been discussed more broadly, not just as a problem in Paul's ethics, but uh, philosophically as well. Let me suggest to you two authors one from the 1700s and one from the early 20th century. David Hume, the uh, empiricist philosopher of Scotland, in his treatise on human nature, argued one cannot derive an ought from an is. You can't say, look, here's what is, and then say, and th therefore this is what you ought to do. He denied the connection philosophically between cause and effect. And in ethics, this can be posed as trying to derive an ought from an is. From the indicative is, uh, you try to derive an imperative ought. Now, uh, G.E. Moore, in his Principia Ethica, also rejected the idea of uh, natural law and he said that good is not a natural property, nor is it a supernatural property. What it is, is an open question. How do we know what good is? Now, I'd, I'd like to say that the problem as it's posed by this line of philosophical thinking is actually a problem that develops when you deny creation. Both of these views deny creation. You can derive an ought from an is if God is creator. And we might note that in Genesis chapter 1, good is exactly what God pronounced each day of creation. After God creates on one day, he says it's good. And uh, so the issue really is an issue of uh, the issue of creation, it's true 
that you can't derive an ought from an is if we're talking about something that has to do with my little life and my little existence and what I'm dealing with in the home or something like that. Say, this is the way it is. Then someone might come back to me and say, well, why should it be that way? Maybe we could live differently. And that's true. But when we're talking about God and we're talking about creation and we're talking about nature, there's a very different story. And indeed, not only can we derive an ought from an is, but we ought to. And God has uh, so purposed it. I also want to throw in a broader issue uh, at this point, too. And I know that I've gone way beyond just talking about Paul and the indicative and imperative, but I want to make this practical for us. And sometimes the philosophical and the cultural are uh, where a practical discussion needs to um, take place. And here we are looking at what I call postmodern tribalism. We know the word postmodern is used a lot, and it's my view that the language of tribalism explains what current postmodernity looks like. Earlier postmodernity wasn't tribal, it was open to alternatives, especially alternatives on the outside of what had been considered acceptable there was exploration and inclusion and a push toward diversity early on. But something is taking place in late postmodernity that we should call tribalism, where a politically correct perspective on certain groups has uh, come into play. And uh, here, this discussion needs to focus on the postmodern tribalisms view of collective evil. So far, the discussion has been primarily about an individual's sin. But what postmodernity and tribalism does is it looks at the corporate, the collective, the social. In the early 20th century, there was this social justice movement that said that there's not just personal sin, but also social sin. In our confessions of sin, we may repent for things that we have done and things we have not done. And although that's a collective confession in the liturgy, many people would see that as individual. We are praying this together, but we're praying about our individual sins, whether we have been aware of them and done them intentionally or whether uh, we have done something unintentional. But collective praying can also have a social dimension. We as a people can acknowledge a sinfulness. And in the early 20th century, there was uh, more of a focus on the social dimensions of evil. And of course, the First World War helped emphasize this uh, perspective very well whole cultures and whole nations involved in social evil. The individual's righteousness was caught up in society and uh, could not easily be separated from it. Well, at the beginning of the 21st century, we have this postmodern tribalism with its focus on collective evil. Now, we can talk in terms, or people talk in terms of historical, systemic, and tribal evil. And often racism is the, the way that this is described, but that is actually a narrowing of the discussion. So your personal sin is one thing. However, in tribalism, your identity is another. And the only indicative is the narrative of your tribe's sin and guilt. There is no divine indicative of grace and mercy. There's no provision of salvation. There's no justification. And there's no power of transformation. It's only your tribal identity that stands there as an immovable rock that you have to acknowledge. And therefore, it's your guilt. Uh, there is no evaluation of the facts 
versus the narrative of guilt. There is no repentance, no contrition, no penance, no absolution of sin, and there's no reconciliation. Or if people talk about reconciliation, they try to ignore all the other and uh, don't ever get anywhere. And uh, related to that is the fact that your tribe's identity is evil is part of my tribe's identity. In other words, the narrative of your sin with your people is important for me and must remain because it helps me uh, understand who I am. And this gets into the idea of tribal victimhood. Now, there's a lot to be said here. There's a lot more. But what I'm trying to point out is that in the early 20th century, our focus is more on groups than it is on individual out in society. Individuals uh, do lots of wicked things. Um, but what really counts is your tribal identity and the fact that your tribe has done wicked things. So tribal identity is important. Now, this isn't just a 20th, 21st century discussion. This is also a discussion for reading Romans. Because when Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, what he has actually proven by that point in Romans is that both groups that make up humanity have sinned. His first group in Romans 1.18 through the end of the chapter is the Gentiles. They have sinned by turning to idolatry and doing homosexual acts both of which are against nature, and then also all kinds of other sins that follow those. And the sin list at the end of chapter 1 in Romans is the longest sin list in Paul. But then in Romans 2.17, Paul turns to the Jew and indicts the Jews as sinful people as well. And he lists <laughs> various acts that the Jews uh, do to prove his point. And then when he summarizes things in Romans 3, 10 through 18, by quoting various passages in the Old Testament, what he's doing is he's saying that humanity in general is sinful. Now, it's possible that we can say because the collective, both Jews and Gentiles, are sinful, therefore I, or you, singular, are sinful as well. And that does seem to be how Paul's thinking. But let's not forget that he also has, and primarily has in those first chapters of Romans, the collective in view. Now, as we look at this issue in terms of scholarship, uh, we're going to find some very poor solutions to this problem of indicative imperative that have been suggested. The person who gave us this language of indicative and imperative is Rudolf Bultmann. His theology was regularly uh, off base. Uh, his liberal Lutheranism uh, was combined with his existential philosophy and it led to all sorts of distortions uh, of reading the scriptures. Uh, now, with regard to the indicative and imperative issue, his focus does come uh, from a very Lutheran perspective. The indicative is God's declaration of justification. It is understood as his grace. It involves no change in behavior. It lays a claim on the individual of obedience to God. But ethics, and this is where his existentialism comes in, has no specific or Christian content. There's no real difference between the Christian and the unbelieving neighbor in terms of how they live. It's just in terms of how they think about the fact of God's indicative. Ethics 
though has no specific content. Yet Bultmann sees the imperative is derived from the indicative. Being made gods, we are called into obedience. He therefore maintains his Lutheran theology, putting all the weight on, into the indicative and his existentialist philosophy. There's no content to ethics, just obedience. No, you don't know exactly what that looks like. But more importantly, perhaps, for the ongoing discussion, there is no power. There's no power of God here. There is a change of status that God can give, but there's no empowering presence of God that can make the sinner righteous. Now, Morton Scott Enslin, also writing about the same time, but across the channel from Boltman, uh, wrote a book called The Ethics of Paul. Uh, he said, salvation by faith in Paul does not logically lead to ethics, but his concern for ethics is a glorious logical flaw. This is following that same line of thinking that you can't derive an ought from an is, and yet it's a glorious flaw to try to do so anyway, because isn't it nice that we try to live good lives after all? So here again is the... Uh, a refusal to find a way to connect the indicative and imperative in anything except um, just be obedient and uh, just know that you were saved anyway. Maurice Gogel, in his Paul's Ethics in the Primitive Church, to bring in the French, uh, here says that Paul placed two ethics side by side, which are not in perfect harmony. An imperative's ethic derived from his Judaism, which in Paul deals with our present life in the sphere of the flesh, and an ethic derived from forgiveness and assurance of redemption, which addresses our life in the spirit. The indicative is the second, the imperative is the first in him. They stand side by side, they're not related. In England, C.H. Dodd said that theoretically, Paul believed Christians should be led by the Spirit. But he in fact doubted the practicality of this and thus expounded the law of Christ. Now, I've earlier suggested that Galatians 6.2 might have to do with a reference to love as the law of Christ, um, 1 Corinthians 9.21 as well. Uh, but here he's saying that here, this law of Christ is a somewhat, compre it's a comprehensive and somewhat detailed scheme of ethical teaching. And uh, he says this law is essentially the precepts which Jesus gave his disciples in which they then handed down to the church. And in that, he would have in mind something like uh, the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain in Matthew and Luke, respectively. Eric Wallstrom in The New Life in Christ in 1950 said that the law plays no part at all in Paul's ethic. Now, in a later lecture, I will argue that that's not at all true. But we've already made reference to challenging that with the look at 1 Corinthians 5 and how Paul is using the Leviticus Holiness Code to answer a problem in the church. Be that as it may, this is a very popular view that the law plays no part in Paul's ethics. And Volstrom says, because the Christian is under grace and in Christ, he needs no code of morals. There is instead a spontaneous morality what the new man does as a man in Christ is ipso facto good, for the nature of the new man is love. There's no imperative, so there is no problem between the indicative and imperative. But Volstrom sees this as Paul's ideal. His churches were not there, and therefore sometimes Paul falters in this ideal of his ethic and actually does give particular advice to his churches. Well, what Wallstrom's actually doing is he's trying to do, uh, he's trying to provide an interpretation of Paul's ethics uh, 
someone in the first century through the lenses of something that pops up in the 1950s called situation ethics, which says that there is no content to ethics, only the principle of love. And situations ethics said that in the situation, love will show you the way. You don't need further concrete advice. It just doesn't sound like Paul. And that final statement in Wallstrom admits that. His churches weren't there and so forth. So he actually does give advice. This is uh, reading someone to try to interpret them and saying that your interpretation actually finds contradiction in them. But truth be told, the contradiction is in the interpreter and not in Paul. From a Catholic perspective, we have Rudolf Schnackenberg writing in the middle of the 20th century. He emphasizes the eschatological dimension of Paul's ethics, and this is going to be an important part of the solution to the indicative and imperative, already not yet. He's also not operating out of the strict Lutheran understanding of the indicative of grace and the imperative of ethics that we've primarily been noting so far, although not everybody we've looked at is Lutheran. Schnackenberg says that through baptism, the Christian shares in God's gift of salvation and receives divine life. Notice we get two things here, the gift and then the divine life. This is more, this isn't just a static, um, an indicative that's static, like a degree conferred on you but there's something more dynamic, divine life, that is part of the indicative. This is an important development for us. This life will be revealed in its fullness in the last day. And the Christian presently struggles against the world's evil powers that have not yet submitted to God's rule. Here we get an already not yet eschatology. In the already, we still live in this age, but the age to come is broken in. And there will come a time when this age comes to an end and the age to come continues without it. And so as we live in the overlap of the ages, we continue this struggle with the world's evil powers. Now, uh, Schnackenberg also says that Paul's ethic has two focal points. And both of these are going to be indicatives that include imperatives. The first indicative is redemption, which is already given to us by God, and it impels us toward the sanctification of our way of life, our way of living. So having been redeemed, we now want to live into that life of redemption. There you get the indicative and imperative relationship. Then secondly, uh, the indicative of salvation is another focal point in Paul's ethic. He says salvation not yet attained, which demands the exertion of all our powers if we are to achieve it. And then the indicative imperative is, the Christ, is uh, that the Christian needs after baptism to cooperate with the grace of God. And that's, that's a very uh, um, Thomas Aquinas uh, Catholic understanding of the grace that enables and that we need to cooperate with in the Christian life. So I think we have some development here, although um, we'll see how some others have, have expressed some of the more positive relationship between indicative and imperative. R. Newton Flew in his Jesus and His Way said that we should see ethics as a response to grace. And in fact, it's three responses of grace. The responses of grace are faith, hope, and love. Now, Wolfgang Schraga offers a helpful corrective in the middle 20th century to uh, 
people like Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, Schraga um, offers an all-out attack on the notion that Paul's ethic is wholly pneumatic and lacks concrete norms of any kind. The idea that uh, by wholly pneumatic we would mean that it's ethics is just spirit-led and that there's no concrete norms that you can talk about for the Christian life. Um, the ethical admonitions of Paul's letters cannot be dismissed as due only to a weakening of the eschatological hope. In other words, when Paul gives a sin list and says, don't do these things, and if you do them, you won't enter the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11, uh, 10 through, and 11, for example, then uh, that's not where he's got some flaw in his theology. It's not a weakening of eschatological hope. Uh, rather, his ethical teaching existed alongside his eschatology from the beginning. And so Paul's ethics is fundamentally concrete. But what is the connection? Well, Victor Paul Furnish, a Methodist, a liberal Methodist, uh, wrote a book in 1968 called Theology and Ethics in Paul. His argument in this book was that theology and ethics are integrally related. You can't have theology in one circle and ethics in another circle. And uh, you can't say that there's no connection between the two. They exist in some awkward relationship to each other or non-relationship to each other. Or even that you uh, have these two circles and have some way of getting from the first to the second. But rather, there's going to be one circle. Now, we could sometimes describe this uh, in the way Paul lays out some of his letters. Galatians and Romans are examples where Paul has some sort of more theological discussion in the beginning and then turns to a more ethical discussion in the end. In Galatians, when Paul comes to chapter 5, he turns to discuss ethical issues. And in Romans, when Paul comes to chapter 12, he turns to ethical issues. A more theoretical discussion in chapters 12 and 13, and then very particular discussion in 14 and 15. But both sections of ethics in Galatians and Romans comes after a theological discussion. Now, one obvious point to, to bring out, and Victor Paul Furnish does this in this book, is to show how th thoroughgoing theology and ethics are intertwined in Romans and Galatians and in Paul's theology in general. In other words, when Paul's dealing with theology in the beginning of Romans, he's dealing with it as a theology of ethics. And when he deals with ethics, later in the book, his, what he says ethically is based on his theological uh, perspective. So there's one circle, and uh, that's one step in the right direction for our discussion of this issue. Now, Paul, uh, Furnish also says that the indicative and imperative are not a distinction between the theological and the pastoral. They stand united as two dimensions of the gospel. The imperative is not based on or does not proceed out of the indicative. It is not an actualizing of what God has given only as a possibility. In that, he's responding to Boltman. So Boltman, for Furnish, is wrong when he says that the relationship between the indicative and imperative is become what you are. Rather, the Pauline imperative is not just the result of the indicative, but fully integral to it. The believer, through righteousness by faith, belongs to the new realm with a new sovereign and receives new life, not just the possibility of new life. Obedience is constitutive of the new life, not preliminary to it, a condition or secondary to it as a result. 
In other words, you don't have to obey in order to receive God's grace, God's salvation. And the ethics is not secondary or a result of the indicative, as though, for example, ethics is just a matter of our gratitude for the grace of God, which is something you often hear in Protestant circles. But rather, the, the ethics of Paul is constitutive of the new life that is given in Christ. This is very important, a very important dimension to the discussion, a development, and something I would agree with thoroughly. So eschatology, the already not yet, for Furnish, is the heuristic key to Paul's theology and ethics. Let's look at this more uh, fully. Just a reminder then, Boltmann's idea of justification in Paul is simply a status that God gives us. He says, become what you are, but uh, it's a status. You are still a sinner. Uh, who has been justified. Uh, so therefore, ethically, you should live up to your God-given status. There's this demand. There's no notion of God's empowering presence. And theology for Boltmann is just anthropology. It has to do with describing the human condition, not uh, the power of God. In response to Boltmann came Ernst Kesemann, um, a student of Boltmann who said, no, there's, there's an apocalyptic dimension to Paul's thought. Uh, here's how this works out. Justification isn't simply a status. God looks at you just as if you hadn't sin, sinned. Uh, justification is God's power for salvation. That's what he meant by apocalyptic or, or eschatology. Eschatology is God's bringing his lordship to creation, the inbreaking of God's reign. And so that inbreaking of God's reign, that's an apocalyptic vision, God's coming to deal with the situation. And this coming of God uh, is a coming of his power for salvation. So following on that then, uh, Victor Paul Furnish says, the heuristic key to Paul's theology as a whole, the point in which his major themes are rooted and to which they are ultimately oriented, is the apostle's eschatological perspective. Eschatology, therefore, is properly the first, not the last section in an exposition of Paul's theology. He sees eschatology as Kesemann did, and so believers live under Christ's lordship. Perhaps we can look at it this way. We have the blue line at the bottom, this age, and the yellow line at the top, the age to come, overlapping. We have sin, law, and death as characteristics characteristic of this age. And we have justification or righteousness, Christ and the Spirit, and life as characteristic of the age to come but they are already present in this overlap of the ages. So it's apocalyptic, eschatological. Um, the heuristic key is God's inbreaking power into this age. So apocalypticism uh, for Kesemann and Furnish has to do with the active work of God to establish righteousness, not just justification, has to do with God looking at us as if we had not sinned. So in conclusion, we need a right understanding of grace. That was one of the problems, I think, with some of the earlier people we looked at. It's both a forgiving grace and a transforming grace. It's not just that you have fulfilled the requirements in one way or another, whether given to you by God or through your own effort, and then received a certificate. But rather, there is something 
more at work uh, that has to be discussed in terms of a dynamic theology, a theology of power, what might be called an apocalyptic or eschatological theology by some. It brings in the notion of a transforming grace, the power of God to bring new life. And so we might then turn to a passage like 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21 to capture this. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Greek actually simply has, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In this passage, we have the outworking of a theology of grace that involves both forgiving and transforming grace. Both of these have to do with a new creation perspective. Not only are you forgiven, and therefore reconciled to God, but you are also made the righteousness of God. And both of these take place in Christ. It's not as if you, you cooperate with God's grace as a, an enabling grace, but rather uh, it would be better to talk about participating in the power of God at work in you to bring about this new creation. And that power is a power that both forgives or reconciles and makes righteous. It's as though there is a story that is a story that uh, talks about how bad things are and then how everything comes right. And as you listen to the story, you realize it's not just a story but rather a story in which you can enter and make it part of your life. It's not just a story where the characters and the plot are moving along as characters and plot on a page in a narrative of some work of fiction, but it's a true story that invites you in. And as you enter it, you discover the power of the story yourself the story of God at work uh, through Christ in us. And so this is where we uh, need to reconcile this problem of the indicative and imperative. Uh, Furnish was on the right track here in saying that there's a whole new dynamic uh, that is at work and it's God's empowering presence as Gordon Fee put it in uh, a major book he wrote uh, about the power of the spirit in our lives. Of course, it's both the power of the cross in Christ Jesus, as Romans 6 points out, and the power of the work of the spirit in us, as Romans 8 points out. And it's this uh, dynamic that is what the grace of God is all about and is therefore the way in which we can see that it's not actually a problem of indicative and imperative, but the indicative itself uh, is this power of forgiveness and transformation that therefore is both theological and ethical.